Alright, so in this video lecture we're going to discuss some other things that we might be thinking about when we're uh, considering conducting fiscal policy. So when we're trying to address either unemployment or rising prices and we elect to use either expansionary or contractionary fiscal policy making changes to our government spending or taxation, um, it seems simple on the surface but obviously there's some other things we have to think about. So, for example, when we're looking at our EDAS model, uh, we might want to ask ourselves, well, is fiscal policy, is it focused on affecting the demand side of the economy or the supply side? And when we went through the uh, analysis of the, f the fiscal policy, what we saw is that given a change in government spending or household taxes, uh, income taxes, we saw that the aggregate demand curve would shift to the left or the right. Um, the question is, could we do something with our government spending and taxation that would affect supply side? And the answer is yes, but it's not quite so simple as it is on the demand side, and here's why. If you think about what government spends money on and in what ways that government spending affects firms' ability to produce their goods and services, well, we can point to things like infrastructure, right? Roads and bridges and water and sewer lines and power lines. Um, obviously, better infrastructure will make firms more productive. It will be easier for them to conduct their business. Uh, likewise, public education. When government spends money uh, to provide public schools, that is going to create a more educated, more skilled labor force, which is then going to help firms be more productive. And then in addition, uh, sometimes government spends money on things like research and development, providing grants to researchers at universities or in private companies to try to develop new technologies, uh, discover new types of medication or alternative energy sources. So these are all ways that government can spend money to try to boost the aggregate supply, right, to make things easier for firms. The problem is that when we spend money building a road, building a school and educating children, investing in research and development. We're going to be spending money today, which, if it's government spending, we saw is going to affect the demand side of the model. Um, but in terms of it affecting the supply side of the model, it's going to take a lot longer for that government spending to pay off. Right? We don't just decide to build a road today and poof, we have a road that can, firms can use to transport their goods and services. We don't educate a child today and poof, they're a better worker. Right? It takes a long time to build good infrastructure. It takes a long time to educate people. Um, and in, of course, research and development. We may spend a lot of money on uh, ideas and research that doesn't actually pay off in the end. So while we can think about changes to government spending and taxation that will affect the supply side of the economy, what we have to keep in mind is that supply side policy is much more focused on what can be done in the long run to achieve long run economic growth. All right. Now, if we're going to be focusing on demand side fiscal policy, what we have to also recognize is that there is going to be a trade-off. And so when we looked at expansionary or contractionary policy and we saw the demand curve shifting left or right, what we saw is that in cases of uh, expansionary policy, we can try to boost the economy and bring unemployment down. But of course, the downside was that that would put upward pressure on prices. And likewise, when we employed contractionary fiscal policy to try and keep prices you know, from rising too quickly, um, maybe we could slow the growth or slow the rate of uh, change in the price level, but the downside was we may lead the economy into economic contraction and potentially put people out of jobs by increasing unemployment. So whenever we're conducting fiscal policy focused on demand side, we have to accept that when we're considering unemployment versus prices, we can try to bring unemployment down, but prices may rise, or we can try to push prices back down at the risk of increasing unemployment. Now, if we could do something in the short run to try and boost aggregate supply, well, as we saw in that scenario, um, it's good news all around. We get higher output, lower unemployment, and downward pressure on prices. But again, as we discussed just a minute ago, uh, the supply side policy takes much longer to pay off. So if we're trying to address a problem in the short run, if we're trying to solve unemployment or prices today, we have to be willing to accept that trade-off, given that we're going to be making changes uh, in government spending and taxation that ultimately, in the short run, affect the demand side of the economy. Now, in terms of spending versus taxation, we might ask ourselves, well, would it be better to 
um, you know, if we're doing expansionary policy, for example, would it be better to increase government spending or decrease taxes? And there's not necessarily a good answer to say one is better than the other, but in terms of the way the math works, we can uh, demonstrate that a dollar in spending is going to have a larger impact on the economy than a dollar in uh, tax cuts, for example. So if I'm the government and I go to a firm and I spend a dollar, right, buying something from the firm, that's going to set off that multiplier effect. But if I go to a household and I say, I'm going to cut your taxes by a dollar, well, they're not necessarily going to rush out and spend that entire dollar. So remember when we talked about the marginal propensity to consume, we demonstrated that you know, typically people, when they receive extra income, if I, you know, if, if I, if a house receives an extra dollar, they may spend only 90 cents of that dollar and save the other 10 cents. So in terms of an actual material effect on the economy, given a tax cut, that initial hit to the economy is going to be a little bit smaller than if the government were to turn around and go spend a dollar instead. All right. So we could track that multiplier effect, both in terms of the increase in spending, but also in terms of uh, the tax cut. And what we would see is that that tax multiplier overall would be smaller than the spending multiplier. So in terms of whether spending more or taxing less is better, we can't necessarily make that kind of normative judgment. All we can say is that if you want to achieve the same impact on the economy, if you want to grow the economy by a certain amount, well, it would take a tax cut of a larger magnitude than a change in spending. So to grow the economy by some amount, you may need to spend an extra $100 billion, but to achieve the same effect with a tax cut may take $120 billion because that tax multiplier is going to be smaller. Now, <clears throat> conducting fiscal policy takes time, right? And there are three lags in particular, and a lag is something that just slows you down, right? And so the first problem we're into is that we may not necessarily realize right away that our economy is in trouble. We may not necessarily realize uh, the minute that unemployment starts to tick up or the minute that prices start to rise faster than normal. And so we face what we call this recognition lag. Uh, before you can start addressing a problem, you first have to recognize that there's a problem that needs fixing. So that's our first lag. We've got to realize there's a problem. Once we realize there's a problem, well, then we have to figure out, well, what are we going to do about this problem? Right? Um, if we're trying to conduct expansionary policy, um, how much of a, of, a, of a boost to the economy do we want to try to stimulate? Do we want to use a change in spending or a change in taxing? Or do we want to make some, you know, use some combination of the two? And so it's going to take time for members of Congress and the president to sit down and negotiate you know, a plan to, put the, to then put into action. And um, you know, Congress sometimes can get uh, uh, involved in very uh, long and lengthy debates. And so again, it's going to take time for Congress to uh, settle on some course of action. Now, assuming a plan is actually made, well, then it's going to take time to actually put the plan into action. So we have this uh, uh, implementation or execution lag. So we have to first recognize there's a problem. We have to then make a decision to figure out what to do about it. And then we have to actually put our plan into action. And in the meantime, whatever problem is being uh, experienced may potentially just be worsening. All right? So we'd like to you know, think that as policymakers, we can identify our problems quickly and just make decisions quickly and get it, you know, our plans into action quickly. Uh, but the reality is we're going to be experiencing these lags all along the way. Now, the next thing to consider um, is the fact that we've got now two economic models. We've got the original aggregate expenditures model that Keynes developed in response to the Great Depression. And we noted that that model in particular is good for analyzing an economy that's in a deep recession that is experiencing a great deal of slack when there's a lot of resources going unused and prices have fallen and wages have fallen and they've all become sticky. And in the scenario like that, what we noted is that a government can step in and employ expansionary fiscal policy by increasing spending or decreasing taxes. And in the end, we would see that that fiscal policy, that change in spending or taxation, would have a very large effect on the economy. Uh, the multiplier effect, either in terms of spending multiplier or tax multiplier, would be relatively large. And the reason for that was because of all that slack. When you have all that slack, all those unused resources, um, prices and wages fall, and they get stuck. And there's little to no risk of inflation 
uh, when you're initially trying to stimulate the economy out of a deep recession. Now when we turn to the ADAS model, remember this is a model that can look at an economy that is in a deep recession at low levels of output but also at you know medium to higher levels of output. And once we account for different levels of output and we, uh, we add the supply side analysis to the model, what we saw is that yeah initially prices may be sticky, they may, there may be little to no risk of inflation, uh, but as the economy grows and we start to take up that economic slack and we start to get workers back to work, well, eventually we're going to start to see resource prices like wages start to rise. And then we're going to see the overall price level rise. And as we noted when we first talked about prices and inflation, that as prices rise, our money loses purchasing power. So in the case in which the economy is not necessarily in a deep recession and government chooses to employ uh, expansionary policy, yeah, we can spend some more dollars, we can cut some taxes, and there will still be a multiplier effect. Right? So we'll still get those dollars that get spent again and again and again. But now, once we account for the fact that prices are going to begin to rise, and every time that dollar gets spent again and again, it's going to have a little bit less purchasing power, uh, what we'll see is that in terms of the actual material output that we produce as a result of this expansionary policy, won't be as large as if prices had just stayed the same. Right, as if prices had remained sticky and not become flexible. So what we have to uh, be careful about when we are especially choosing to employ expansionary policy, where we're trying to address a recession, bring unemployment down, is that we face that risk, that trade-off, in terms of inflation. And the more we try to stimulate the economy, right, the higher levels of output we reach, the less slack we have, uh, the greater risk of inflation, and the weaker that multiplier effect. Now the last thing to consider um, is the end result of all this policy, right? When we're choosing to do expansionary, contractionary policy. Well, with expansionary policy, right, we're addressing a recession. We're addressing dips in output, right, when, when GDP is declining. Now we aren't necessarily going to be able to use our expansionary policy to totally eliminate or avoid that recession, right? It's just, it's not possible. So at the very least, what we're going to try to do is prevent that recession from lasting for too long of a period of time, and to prevent GDP from falling too much. So when you look at the business cycle, and you see that contraction leading into a trough, what we're going to be trying to do is kind of put a cushion under things, so that there may still be a period of recession and contraction, but hopefully it won't be as uh, severe a recession as if we had sat back and done nothing as, as fiscal policymakers. Likewise, in periods of expansion, when the economy is at risk of becoming overheated, when we are facing uh, the potential for prices to begin rising, well, we can employ contractionary policy to try and tamp down on those prices. Um, but of course, we're not necessarily going to be able to eliminate um, all of that inflation. We're not necessarily going to uh, prevent the, GDP, uh, the economy from growing, prevent GDP from rising. We just may try to put the brakes on a little bit. Right? So rather than putting a cushion under the contraction, we try to you know, put the brakes on an expansion to avoid prices getting out of, out of control. And so when we look at the business cycle and we look at how fiscal policy relates to that business cycle, what we have to recognize is that we can't feasibly eliminate the business cycle. Right? We can't take that bumpy ride and perfectly smooth it out so, we, so that we're following just a perfectly smooth upward trajectory. With the, at the very least, what we can do is try to smooth it out, right? So rather than a wild ride up and down through the business cycle, maybe it's, you know, a slightly less bumpy ride, right? So if you're at Six Flags, think of it as, you know, a ride on the Texas Giant versus a ride on the Mini Mine Train, right? There's still some ups and downs. They just aren't quite as scary. So we can't eliminate the business cycle. The best we can do at the end of the day is try to just smooth it out. So again, when we're conducting fiscal policy, um, we have a lot of options. There are different problems we try to address, and we can certainly do the best we can to address those problems. But at the end of the day, um, there are just a lot of these other things we have to consider, and that's certainly going to affect the decisions that our fiscal policy make, makers make as they attempt to uh, manage the economy.